Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Darren. I'm the CEO and co-founder of VividQ. And uh, there we are. Uh, so first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to talk today. Uh, so VividQ is a UK-based startup that is looking to drive the next evolution in digital display. But today is not going to be so much a sales pitch about my own company as more of an opinion piece on what I feel are the major challenges in, uh, in AR today. So everyone here is looking to learn about XR enablement. And I'm guessing the reason for that is because we've all seen a chart a bit like this somewhere. So when we look at the numbers, AR is really lagging behind expectations in terms of adoption. If we look at recent trends in smartphones, mobile phones, and web, these had almost instant traction, and it seemed very easy relative to what we're having to go through in AR. Uh, the projections for when we achieve that mass adoption, which is kind of 25% of the population, keep on moving out and out and out. We believed in 2016, if you were coming to this conference then, that that would be the year that AR would take off. And then, oh, it's 2017. And then in 2018, all the funding ran out and we had some big names go under. Now 2019, everyone's a little unsure. Everyone's now waiting to see, oh, uh, maybe Apple will do something in 2020, 2021. So this is a constantly moving bar. And I think it's on us to start examining some of the reasons for that. What are the underlying problems that we can probably solve that can help us get, get over this, uh, this issue? So here are my thoughts. So the first one is more of a philosophical point, and I think one that uh, everyone will be familiar with, uh, something I refer to as the killer application fallacy. If only there was some application that would turn the entire world onto AR. Um, in my opinion, this is, this is not a realistic thing to think about. In fact, I think it's the wrong question entirely. There is no single application that's going to capture the imagination of the public. And you can contrast this with something like AI. You cannot explain to somebody about AI and expect them to get it and suddenly see all the applications. It has to be embedded within their everyday experience. So I can tell my grandmother about AR and be like, oh, these immersive realities are going to be great. And because she's an old Scottish woman, she'll turn around and tell me, shut up, Darren, you're boring me. But she'll do it while actively on Amazon using an AI-powered recommendation engine to find out what new knitwear she wants to buy. <laughs> See, that's, that's integration, right? She doesn't know she's using it. It's just a part of the fabric of her everyday life. This is where AR needs to get to. We have a consumer awareness mismatch in that we're trying generally to pose this new technology with all its new applications. This isn't really what people want. People don't, don't know how to use new applications. And we need to gently guide them in a direction where we take existing applications and transfer them to this new medium. Now, the issue with that, as I'm sure we're all aware and we all try to avoid desperately, is the current crop of hardware doesn't really deliver on that. Neither in terms of style and form factor, uh, the contextual awareness, you know, being able to place objects in the environment, and the visual experience is often a little bit limited. And indeed, when we look at some of the images we've been presented with, I mean, this community is very, uh, is very active in saying what the future could look like, and it looks great. I mean, if we could do this, that'd be fantastic. Although, I don't think the consumer is ready for it. And when we look at what's actually delivered, it's still very much first base, okay? This is not a criticism, this is just a fact, right? This is not a particularly old field. Um, we are still at very much the beginning of what the technology can do, but, it, but I believe the technology is already there that we can start addressing some of these limited applications that the consumer can already get on board with. So let's take a little bit of a dig into exactly what some of these issues are, right? So fundamentally, we are still basing all our devices on stereoscopic display, at least in the kind of mixed reality sphere. So this has several issues that you're all familiar with, field of view and eye box being the classic one, Resolution, because you're staring at a small micro display, but it's very close to your eye. And then the form factor. So there, usually there's some dramatic trade-off here. You either have a nice form factor, the image quality is kind of low, or you have really nice field of view, but the form factor is massive, and it's not something my grandmother is going to wear in the street. So critically, what we also lack is any depth of field. Now, this seems like a somewhat minor one compared to the others, but actually kind of important. I'm sure you've... I'm sure you're all aware of this effect. Uh, if you hold a finger up in front of your face and you focus on it, uh, the background should go fuzzy. If you focus on the background, the finger should go fuzzy. Kind of important for your ability to localize yourself and objects in space. And if you don't have that, you get something called divergence accommodation conflict, where you're trying, your eyes are trying to converge on an object, but you're focusing on a single plane. And that's very uncomfortable. And in fact, 
almost 20% of the population will feel nauseous or get headaches due to that, which basically cuts out a fifth of our market immediately if we're going to stay with stereoscopic display. So AR today, largely, there are some exceptions, is constrained on this left panel here where everything's always perfectly in focus and you're relying on psychological cues to tell you where you are in space. On the right is what you want. You want objects to defocus at the same rate as the environment in a natural way. But that turns out it's tricky to do. Thankfully, there is a solution. And it's existed for a while. Uh, since the early 90s, we've had this concept of computer-generated holography. And this is, at least in the academic circles, regarded as kind of the pinnacle of display technology in that it precisely mimics the way that we observe real-world objects and simulates that process. But it has historically been extremely difficult to do. So this is why you do not see holographics featured on any current-day AR sets. However, the good news is this is now changing. So here is a hologram we made ourselves in an AR display. You see that uh, you have two elephants. One is out of focus to the other. If you'd like to see a video of this, I wasn't brave enough to put videos in this presentation because that will go wrong. But do go on the VividQ YouTube site, and you can see multiple videos of seeing cameras change their focus, and you can see different objects come into, into focus as you change that. And you can come try out the real thing at our booth, which I'll talk about later. So let's talk a little bit about what this is. All right, here's my only technical slide, so b bear with me. Um, so when we, when we observe the world, what we definitely don't do is look at a big array of pixels. But that's essentially what we do whenever we look at a current display. So those people holding up mobile phones right now or have their laptops open, you're looking at a big array of colored pixels. But when you look at anything else in the world, you're not seeing that. You're seeing some object. Well, you're not really seeing the object. You're seeing light reflected off that object. The reflected light forms some kind of complicated pattern that hits your eye and you interpret that as the object. So if I wanted to make, in some sense, the ideal display system, I'd want to somehow mimic that process. I'd want to compute what that wave front was of reflected light and present that to your eye. And that's, in fact, what we can do. So by calculating some very complex pattern uh, that we call a hologram, we can reflect light off that pattern, and that acts as a kind of engineering medium that manipulates the light into whatever shape we want, like an elephant or a whale or whatever you like. Okay? So, turns out, that in itself is quite difficult to do, but if you can do it, if you're calculating the full wavefront given to an object, you can imagine that that contains all the 3D information about that object. So you don't lose anything. It contains a perfect replication, a visual replication of the object itself. And so in this sense, holography is the ideal display medium. But it's hard, really, really hard, uh, or has historically been. So why is it hard? Well. First of all, one requires extremely precise control of the light field. So I have some digital display. I'm using it to display my hologram, which is this weird looking white noise uh, object. And that's going to be the thing that manipulates my light and modulates it to give me my image. But this means I need very, very small pixels because I need very precise control over the individual rays of light. So typically less than six microns, which is a couple of orders of magnitude smaller than you'll find in your average uh, laptop or phone screen. Then you need to control those pixels extremely precisely. Again, tricky. So the more control you have over those, the better quality hologram you get, because you can control your light more and more precisely. Getting that into a small form factor is then a challenge, because now I need to have some very complex electronics controlling an awful lot of pixels. So bearing in mind, a 4K device would be about half an inch across. That's a lot of pixels in a very small area. Uh, and so you need to have some very, very fancy electronics in order to do that. And then it needs to switch very fast. So you need to be able to change that image extremely quickly uh, because in an AR or VR setting, you don't want to have a low frame rate that will cause latency and so forth. So these are all very tricky problems, but I'm very glad to say there are now several companies where you can just go on, onto their online store and just buy these things off the shelf now. So these are now widely available, and this is a relatively recent innovation. We're now at the point where the display hardware is ready for holographic applications, at least for the near to eye case because the devices are still quite small, so AR is a natural home for them. So, good news there. Second, the optics. So, holography is a very different way of thinking about optics. Your average engineer coming out of uh, optics school uh, will learn all about free space optics and, and so forth, but this is a very different branch called Fourier optics, and it works a little bit differently. So, the main holdup here is just the general lack of knowledge about the area, and 
uh, people, being, people believing, oh, like you'll still be constrained on field of view and iBox and all these other concerns. While holography does share some of these problems, they're for very different reasons. And the nice thing about those reasons is they're much more malleable. Uh, we, can, we can play a lot more with a hologram than we can with a normal real space image, and so we have a lot more degrees of freedom to work with to be able to play tricks in order to get better visual effects. Again, thankfully, there are multiple companies that have stepped in who are now experts in holographic optical elements, diffractive optics, and so forth, uh, that are now mass manufacturing the optical components required in order to get uh, holographics where they need to be. The final issue, compute. Okay, so if you can imagine, I have my, have my object. I want to simulate every ray of light bouncing off that object. And if I want a high res image, that's an awful lot of points. And so traditionally, it would take an enormous wealth of compute in order to do this. In a recent paper published in Nature, uh, the tail end of last year, uh, a Korean group was able to generate this nice dinosaur here at about 15 frames per second, but they had three big chunky computers to do it. So that seems a little far away uh, from, uh, from being a consumer level device, and it certainly doesn't seem like it will be untethered anytime soon. And even then, the image quality is still probably not where it needs to be in order to satisfy the average consumer. So here's the, the small plug. Uh, VividQ, on the other hand, uh, has created a set of algorithms that allows you to do this ultra fast on very simple compute resources in high quality. And this is important. So while this is bad enough, so I need three big GPUs to produce this versus VividQ only needing one, it gets worse when I scale this. So say I wanted to double the resolution of my display or double the resolution of my image, the traditional algorithms scale as n to the four, which is pretty much the worst you can think of. So if I want to double my resolution, I have to, comp I have to multiply my compute by 256. That's not a good scaling, whereas our algorithm does it in n log n, so basically linear. So with that in mind, this is the final piece of the puzzle. Okay. So we have the optics, we have the display devices, we have the underlying software, so let's go do it. And why should we do it? So just to reiterate. With holography, you do get those full depth of field images. You can come see this. Uh, not only that, but as I mentioned, because you're working in this very different domain, this Fourier domain, you have a lot more flexibility in how you manipulate the image. So you can create sub-retina level uh, resolution in the, in the image plane, because bearing in mind, you're not looking at a screen of pixels, you're just looking at overlapping light. You can create extremely high resolution images. Uh, and you overcome all the convergence accommodation problems that currently plague stereoscopic devices because you're presenting real depth. The optics can be very simple and small. A holographic display doesn't require any bulky optics, doesn't need any lenses. All you need is a display element, a light source, and something to reflect the thing into your eye, and that's it. So if you want to get a small form, for, form factor, if you ever want to get this into a pair of sunglasses, this is one of the only ways to do it and maintain reasonable image quality. Finally, we can compute around imperfections in both the optics and your eye. So again, because the advantage of working in this hologram space means that if you, if you take some prescription glasses and you have to wear them underneath your headset, this basically means you don't have to. We can take into account the imperfections in your eye, compute that into the hologram to return a perfect sharp image without you needing to wear glasses at all. The upshot as well is we can also compute around bad optics. So you can make you know, your, your lenses and, and whatever optics you do put in there, you can make them relatively imperfectly and cheaply, and we can simply compute around those imperfections instead of having to create very high quality optics and reflectors. So not only good for the consumer, but also will drive down price because we can manufacture the, uh, the glasses themselves much cheaper and easier. So how do we achieve this then? How are we going to map this out into the future? Well. Uh, something that we've been doing at VividQ has been creating this ecosystem, bringing together all these partners uh, using our software platform so we can deliver complete solutions to OEMs. Something that has hampered us a little bit uh, as, a, as a field is that you have your display guys, they go to OEMs, try to sell their part. The OEM goes back and is like, well, we need the optics, we need the software. Uh, similar for the rest. You need the entire package. You need to go to these guys with the whole system and say, here is the entire optical engine plus software. Go build a headset for us, and then we'll all do very well. And then you'll have fully holographic uh, uh, applications. So we're very much seeing the first applications within AR, of course. 
uh, but it's not restricted to that. So holographic display is not merely a head-mounted uh, style, uh, style display. Uh, it does allow you to get that kind of Star Trek style hologram where you can have things floating above the screen or in front of the screen. Again, come by our booth, you'll see a demo. Uh, so that opens the door to holographic heads-up displays for automotive, where you want a compact box that just sits on top of, uh, on top of your bonnet and you don't need to worry about uh, uh, having to build it into the car and you get full depth of field, so you get full 3D images. And then later on, moving into things like smartphones, tablets, eventually build a holodeck. But in the short term, this is how we see it. The first target has to be uh, build a set of glasses that appeals to the current user. And in terms of application, I think this means basically just take what we have on our phone and make it in the eye line in a comfortable way, in a form factor that people will wear. This is what I refer to as annotating the world. People don't need monsters jumping out of the walls or game characters or any of these elaborate things. They just want to be able to look at a restaurant and see what the rating it has or see somebody in the distance and be like, oh, I know that guy, I'm Facebook friends with him. Oh, there's his bio, that's his name, I'll remember. Very simple stuff that you're already using your smartphone for that the consumer already understands and they understand this is just a new way of visualizing it. And this can be done now. All the components are there. Uh, if, uh, if OEMs jump on this right now, we could have holographic devices inside two years. The next stage, I believe, will be stepping into that full mixed reality. So once we have that initial consumer uptake, of course there will be those uh, that will say, okay, but we want more. We do want the computer generated monsters. We do want the more elaborate mixed reality. Uh, devices, and that will be the time to then start building out uh, full MR devices based on holographic tech. Then the final step will be taking all those developments, and I should mention, when I, th I, I, I think those initial mixed reality devices will be still on the bulky side, not because of the optics, but because there's still advances to be made in 3D cameras and, and the compute that's required to be on board, but the end goal would be to get back to something extremely slimline, neat form factor, but contains all those mixed reality features we want. The tech is over there, it's ready to go, we could do it now. It's just a case of uh, slow walking it to the consumer so they understand each step and they are comfortable at each point and we don't give them something they just don't understand too early. So, I will summarize there. So we can do it now. Um, this will solve many of the main problems in AR, especially when it comes to display. Uh, the ecosystem is assembling, so all the partners are in place, the display guys, the compute guys, the optics guys, all are starting to turn and pivot towards this direction because, because it is the natural way of doing this. If you want to give uh, viewers the most immersive and realistic experience, you might as well mimic the way that the world presents visual information to us. This is the way to do that. And so this is the key enabling technology and display that will ensure mass adoption of AR. So, I'll leave you with a tagline. <laughs> so, bit of a cue, because the world isn't flat and we shouldn't pretend it is and give everyone stereo display. So come see us at the UK Pavilion. We have uh, a demo available. It's rather a technical demo. So if you are an optical engineer uh, or interested in looking at holographics as, as a future display technology, do please come and see us. Uh, and I will take questions now. Thank you.